Well, welcome once again to the public, everyone. Um, before we get started, just a quick announcement. The um, art break for next week that was uh, originally scheduled with uh, Sam Grossman talking about Gordon Parks photography has been po postponed until September 12th. So instead, next week, I'll be showing a film about the artist um, Richard Mayhew, who, uh, if you don't know, is a, is a very interesting, uh, essentially a landscape painter that has his own distinctive way of uh, abstracting nature. And um, the, the film's entitled uh, Richard Mayhew, Spiritual Landscapes. It's nice because it not only interviews him, but shows him at work. And then afterwards, because the film itself runs about half an hour, you'll have a chance to go downstairs um, in the um, exhibition um, unveiling American Genius and see the Richard Mayhew that's in the KIA collection, which is a really nice example of his work. So that's our, our change for uh, next week. Then. This week, uh, we're going to begin our uh, series of art breaks uh, where uh, artists that are included in the West Michigan area show uh, come in and talk about uh, their work. And uh, today, um, our guest artists are Alex Bonhoff and uh, Michaela Posada. Uh, Alex is going to start first. So I'll just say that um, he's an interdisciplinary artist who's really working at the intersection of science and uh, art. Uh, he utilizes uh, microorganisms, uh, biomaterials, and sound to create these immersive landscapes, uh, installations, I'm sorry, that explore uh, threatened ecosystems and in a larger sense, the desecration uh, being done to the earth by human forces. His piece, uh, Terra Sanguinis, which is Latin for Earth Blood, uh, won the Ninth Wave Studio Award for Ingenuity in Mixed Media or Intermedia. And uh, you can see it right when you walk into the exhibit on your left. So uh, please welcome Alex Bonner. Uh, hello, my name is Alex Von Hoff, uh, and as Greg said in his wonderful introduction, I am an interdisciplinary artist uh, working at the intersection of science and art. I design immersive installations that explore terrestrial consumption, pain, and death. I examine humanity's necropolitics, exceptionalist ideology, and extractivist philosophy as they relate to the incessant destruction of our ecosystems. I attempt to give the earth and all the beings on it a voice to advocate for their survival and to speak of their collective pain. My work is greatly influenced by greenness studies, a hybridized research field founded by Jens Hauser, and my practice is deeply rooted in a love and appreciation for the world around us. I will begin by discussing the theories that uh, support my recent artistic research. First is the chapter Greenness, Sketching the Limits of a Normative Fetish by Jens Hauser from the book titled The Aesthetics of Necropolitics. In this text, Hauser writes that the term green serves the uncritical fetish fetishistic desire to hypercompensate for a systemic necropolitics that has variously taken the form of the increasing technical manipulation of living systems, ecologies, the biosphere, and a very ungreen mechanization which has taken command of life and death. Necropolitics, originally designed, uh, defined by Achille Mbembe, is the power and capacity to dictate who may live and who must die, as well as the material destruction of human and other than human populations and the environment at large. Expanding upon his first text on greenness, Hauser, along with Rasa Smite, Kristen Bergaust, and Rytus Smits, released the text titled Green Revisited, Encountering Emerging Nature Cultures in Art and Research. Drawing from the chapter Inverting and Opening Up Greenness in Art and Curatorial Strategy, Hauser writes that green has become a metaphor we live by, 
one that allows us to focus on one aspect of a concept that keeps us from focusing on aspects inconsistent with that meta metaphor. For example, the intention to metaphorically use green as a proxy to defend ecologically sustainable policies has been superseded by an uncritical attitude, which enables antagonist capitalist mechanisms to appropriate the metaphor by greening everything. The act of greening itself then points to anthropogenically induced action. In this chapter, Hauser details the paradoxical nature sorry, of our relationship with the natural world and this anthropocentrically defined color, stating that plants only appear green. In reality, the light corresponding to the green spectrum is reflected as waste. Therefore, nature is not really green, and referring to nature as inherently green suggests a purified and idealized other than human world that in reality does not exist. Ubiquitous greenwashing masks the damage that unfettered capitalism has inflicted on ecological and social systems in times of environmental crisis with green growth and business models referring to the opportunity to convert ecological issues into business opportunities, therefore leading to the equation of environmental damages and opportunity for profit. This then furthers the multiplicity of false associations of greenness with environmental sustainability. In addition, greening itself as a verb is the alteration of terrestrial vegetation growth due to the global environmental change as a result of alarming levels of CO2 emissions. So it is these theories and paradoxes of greenness that, that underlie much of the work that I will discuss with you today. Um, from a very young age, I was told about the dangers of global warming. I understood at that time that it was something that I might face in my lifetime, but likely near the end. A problem for the future and for my descendants that we have the power and agency to prevent now. And that was about 15 years ago. But now we are witnessing the beginning of a cataclysm, our own personalized extinction event with fatal repercussions, both for ourselves and the other beings with which we share the world. My anxieties and anger at the lack of concrete action led me to advocate for and develop agency for the planet by the planet and for the non-human entities with which we coexist. I attempt to give a voice to the voiceless, those who cannot speak on their own behalf. The first instance of this experimentation occurred with patient zero, which was included in the exhibition A Few Degrees of Change at Scene Metro Space uh, in conjunction with Science Gallery Detroit. Patient zero draws a parallel between the fundamentally ineffective and fraudulent 20th century Western medicinal practices and the performativity of the global political powers in their handling of the climate crisis. The surgical table serves as the embodiment of imminent terrestrial decay occurring right on the threshold of systemic subjugation. The sound of the damaged planet echoes throughout the exhibition space as we witness the Earth undergoing an emergency procedure, its frantically beating heart exposed in the chest cavity of this metaphorical body. We are the doctors in this operating room, and we must do all in our power to save our patient. The video itself was produced with Touch Designer, a uh, software that utilizes a, a nodule-based visual programming language uh, centered in Python. Uh, I began with an MRI scan of a heartbeat and an image of soil and merged the two to create a literal earth heartbeat, which was then buried within the abstracted soil body on top of the surgical table. The surgical table, side table, and surgical instruments are from the early 20th century and were on loan from the Michigan State University Museum collections. Interestingly, they were all donated by the same doctor uh, who ran a Lansing-based medicinal practice uh, at that time. The temporal placement of these objects 
correlates with the conceptual dimension of the piece and marks an incredibly important period in time. The advent of the Anthropocene and the beginning of our divergent path with the rest of the natural world. The audio is a heavily altered version of the recording of the sound of the earth originally taken and released by NASA. It is the sound of our dying planet set ablaze slashed wounded. Terra sanguinis is a vocalization and a visualization of the earth in pain. The algae drips from the organ-like bioreactor onto the steel plate, an object representative of anthropogenic expansion that sits amongst a swath of stones. The stones reference mines, the principal sites of our extraction that appear as terrestrial scars across the landscape. The resulting sound functions as Earth's shriek, a cry to be saved from our incessant mutilation. It is the interaction of the living organism with the steel that leads to the generation of the sound, the clash between humanity's extraction and therefore action and other earthbound non-human entities led to the creation and the vocalization of this pain. Space is the result of an iterative design and redesign process with fabrication of components from multiple sources. Assembled from a five liter flask and a set filter, I designed the manner in which the vessels would connect and had them modified by Scott Bancroft, who is a scientific glass blower. Uh, and he did an absolutely fantastic job uh, with the fabrication. The algae was provided by uh, Dr. Yan Lu and is the descendant of a strain of Chlorella sorokiniana that was originally sourced from Lake Erie. The sound itself is generated by a piezo disc, which is a small contact microphone that is attached to the underside of the steel plate. As the fluid drips, the signal from the microphone passes through a delay and reverb pedal, a distortion pedal, and a mixer before being released through the speakers. A feedback loop generated by the speakers vibrating the steel plate and therefore sending signal through the piezo disc accentuates the distorted effect of the sound by continuously generating new patterns and sound wave interactions. At times resembling a heartbeat, the rhythmic dripping concurrently illustrates life and pain, a reminder that although we are witnessing death on an unfathomable scale, amongst this is life. Life that we must do everything to save, our own and the beings that we share this world with. Over the course of the installation, the steel plate will begin to develop a beautiful patina as a, as a result of its interaction with the nutrient media and the algae. This image was taken on the last day of the previous installation of Terra Sanguinis and the steel plate now exists as a relic of this version and this installation. The same will be true for the steel plate in the gallery here at the Kalamazoo Institute of Arts. They serve as the continued physical embodiment of the installation after it has been disassembled. In time, I will accumulate a collection of these relics that contain within them life, death, and memory. This is an installation and a green bottle, uh, which is the next work that I will discuss. The remaining artworks in my presentation discuss the continuous packaging, reproduction, and modification of natural resources. We collectively envision all non human entities as subordinate and all non living matter as resource. Our relationship with the natural world has transformed interdependence of domination and control, often disguised through greenness and policy and media. These works reflect the societal warping of greenness and its hypocritical reintegration into our modified lands. The presence of green immediately insinuates the presence of nature, 
And yet, as I said before, nature is not green and is entirely absent. Specifically taking the form of an abstract Edwardian case, which is a vessel used to transport plant specimens from the Americas to Europe during the 19th century, Greenbottle is engaged in a dialogue surrounding both environmental and human colonialism. A living being is contained within, removed from the environment in which it is supposed to exist by beings who believe we have the power and right to do so due to some falsified presupposed dominance. This is an installation view of NE10371-1P, NE0589-80L, and landscape in chromium oxide green. Placed within a sterile space in the gallery are 18 vials filled within a chlorophyll, chlorophyllin solution. Chlorophyllin is a semi-synthetic derivative of chlorophyll, and therefore, this package contains an artificialized pseudo-natural greenness. Existing in isolation, the artwork reflects the control we force upon the ecosystem from managed lands to complete decimation and repeated extractions. Again, we view the world as resource and resource alone. The vials have been placed within a plexiglass box, packaged and prepared for distribution. The title, NE058980L, is a packaging number. As such, the contents are a product. Similar to the previous artwork, NE10371-1P is the presentation of a packaged natural extraction. The plexiglass casing was heated and molded around the vial and matches the dimensions of standard packaging. Within the vial is pigment that I extracted from a peace lily with the scientific name of Spathophyllum wassily. To process the plant, I dried the leaves and then boiled them to extract the various types of chlorophyll and terpenoids uh, present in the leaves. I then added alum, which is potassium aluminum sulfate, uh, which is a fixative, and sodium carbonate to the solution, uh, which created a chemical reaction. The precipitate from this chemical reaction was then vacuum filtered and dried, resulting in the pigment shown on the screen. In order to extract the pigment, I destroyed the plant. The performative nature of this destruction with intent to extract echoes our patterns of interaction with the natural world. The pigment is a product that has come at great cost, the sacrifice of a living being, and again is packaged and ready for distribution. Somewhat amusingly, throughout the process of production, I realized that it's almost impossible to synthesize green from living, or more accurately, formerly living beings. An act of resistance, perhaps, the greenness must be artificially synthesized. Oops. The final work I will be discussing today is landscape and chromium oxide green. As the name suggests, it is a landscape painting. Humorously playing with our associations of greenness with natureness, I created this painting to reference the use of green in art and decoration as a substitute for an abstraction of vegetation. It is simultaneously a painting of nothing and of every landscape, forest, and grassland when viewed through an artificial and idealized lens of nature as being indeed green. But chromium oxide green and all other greens are produced through synthetic manufacturing processes and thus have absolutely no connection to the natural world, yet we so readily perceive them as such. In a sense, the use of green in art is propaganda. It convinces us that we are able to harness the truest essence of nature by being able to replicate the lush greens that we are able to perceive falsely supporting our own exceptionalism and allowing us to artificially regenerate the landscapes we have destroyed for our own benefit, pleasure, 
and entertainment. On the screen is my Instagram handle and the link to my website where you can find all of the audio and video mentioned during this presentation, as well as some of my performance and other sculptural work. I would like to thank Alison Wong for including Tara Sanguinis in this exhibition, the Ninth Wave Studio for the Intermedia Award, and the entire curatorial and preparatory staff for their care and consideration in the layout and installation of my artwork. Thank you for your time. Questions. Yes. Do you not like to play the audio when it's not within this, like in situ, when it's not within the installation? What are your thoughts on that as an artist? Uh, so I do think. Uh, I just need to repeat the question really quickly. So the question is, do I not like to play the audio when it's not uh, in situ? The, the reason for not playing any of the audio is mostly due to the live stream um, and kind of delays uh, and technical difficulties. Uh, I think it's actually really helpful to be able to, to view or hear the audio um, because that really is a, a major component of the piece as it specifically relates to Terra Sanguinis. Um, you know, we can walk just into the gallery over there and see it uh, after, which I encourage everyone to do so. Um, yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Are you familiar with Amatov Gulshius, uh, the curse of the nutmeg? I'm not. The nutmeg curse, I'll just get that to come right. Um, I think you'd be interested in it. Um, he writes about um, extractive colonialism um, globally. And he begins by looking at the case of the nutmeg in, um, in a part of Indonesia, what is now Indonesia, um, in the 16th century uh, by the Dutch. Um, and he talks about the, the Bada, it's Bada Bada. I'm looking at my notes, but you better memory than I do. I'm sorry, I forget the but just to make this very quick, the people who were native to the region um, were uh, uh, believed that the landscape spoke. Um, and so that's one of Gosha's major points, is that um, the mountain wasn't just something there to be exploited. It was a being, and it, it spoke. And he says, Later in the book, he really calls on artists. This is why I'm mentioning it to you. He calls on artists um, to give voice back to the landscape. And then it, that's, it seems to me you are working exactly there. Um, and so I just wanted to mention his name to you uh, because you seem very erudite in your approach to your art. And I thought you'd be interested in his work as well. Yes, thank you very much. If I could, uh, after the presentations are done, maybe just get the name uh, and title again from you one more time. That would be great. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. All right. Is that it? All right. Thank you again. Okay, our, our next artist is uh, Michaela Posada, and she is a ceramicist who works primarily with uh, functional ceramics, but uh, more recently she's kind of been venturing into uh, more sculptural forms that take vessels and in a way um, create subtle allusions to bodies that um, in a way have a sculptural presence, there's also a uh, a human presence, and uh, her piece in the um, 
area show, which is in the second gallery, I think it was a, a really wonderful use of terracotta uh, clay without any glaze. Uh, that's really um, the quality of the material is brought out through the, uh, the, the textures and uh, as well as the form. So um, I'll say no more, but uh, please welcome Michaela Posada. Hello, how are you guys doing today? Thank you for coming. Can you guys hear me okay? All right. So I'm just gonna give you a little introduction about me and where I'm from and then get into my work. So I am from Pawpaw, Michigan. Um, I grew up out there on a lake um, with my family. And then growing up, I moved to Kalamazoo and went to school and started my art career at KVCC where I got into ceramics. Um, from there, I transferred into Western's art program and got my bachelor's in finance and ceramics there. When I started, I was um, into functional work, and at that point, I was creating a lot of vessels, so like cups, plates, bowls, all of that kind of thing, um, and I was super intrigued with wood firing and all that atmospheric firing and how... Um, the glazes would come out way different than just doing an electric firing. Um, and even compared to a gas, if you have questions at the end, I can talk about that a little as well. Um, on the left side, we have a vase that, that shows um, uh, plants and whatnot. Um, I've always been super into nature. Growing up, my family spent a lot of time outside and my mom was huge into gardening. So I find a lot of my inspiration and um, the way I've decorated my functional pieces comes from um, being around her in the garden. I don't like to get my hands into her dirt and planting and everything, but I love putting it on my own work in my own way. On the right side um, is actually a wood-fired piece with a chino glaze on it. All right, here are a couple more. And then after I was working in wood fired, I took a workshop that was on color theory and I learned about um, a glaze called myolica, which is using the white base on top of um, a terracotta red clay. Uh, and that started out in Spain. Um, so basically to simplify it is, um, in certain parts of the world, places couldn't get porcelain. And so places that had cheaper materials wanted to come up with a way to um, mimic or copy the process of like porcelain that pure white and doing designs on the outside that were vibrant and colorful. And so um, the way that they did this was through terracotta or through myolka, sorry. And for my inspirations, um, you can see that I am inspired by Talavera. So that's like Mexican pottery. Um, and those designs, like the bright colors and the floral designs, you can see throughout my work. Um, this is um, pieces of work that I had in a show when I graduated at Western. Um, I find myself wanting to make functional work because I love the intimacy and the interaction of each piece that you could use in your daily life. So like a pitcher or a huge serving bowl, like you're bringing people together. And I had a huge family and I just love the idea of like bringing everyone around and using these pieces and making connections and that kind of a thing. And you can see the tale of Talavera like inspiration through the one on the left. And then the one on the right is starting to um, come into my next body of work where I'm really focusing on creating that like um, subtle figurative form. And I tend to do more of a feminine like hourglass shape without my pieces. Um, yeah. 
And here are a couple more. You can see where I'm starting to get more like um, changing the shapes a little, more textural, um, inviting to want to touch and feel and see what's underneath, just not what's on top. Uh, these are some of the first terracotta pieces that I made um, on the left and the right. And through this process, um, I'm going to read my artist statement a little um, to explain. So when I started working in, sorry, when I started working on clay, I was caught up in the functional ceramics and creating an array of different forms used in daily life with colorful floral designs. Um, I've created a new body of work that shows that I've transformed myself and my work into creating large vessels that straddle between the line of sculpture and functional work. The idea of our bodies are vessels has stuck with me. I find myself creating pieces that subtly suggest the figure. The work is to communicate the beauty of the material and communicate that there's beauty in all forms and shapes. Through my art, I find my identity and expression of feeling about my self image and what beauty is. Struggling with being comfortable in my own skin and finding beauty in the natural and vulnerable look has transformed into my artwork. Um, my work invites the viewers to be fascinated by the texture of the red and brown clay body that I am using. My passion is in process of using the clay to create something inviting and interesting for the viewer. Like many, I am fascinated by nature and the beauty that get that we get to experience once we immerse ourselves in it. In my vessels, you can see the rough texture that speaks to um, textures that you might find while walking a trail or see the rough like rocks in a mountain. Um, later on, I'll show you guys some videos of like how I coil each piece and smear each piece with my fingers. But yeah, these are a few more of my pieces of work and you can see how like the shapes are like all different and trying to get that figurative, but um, it's still very subtle and still vessel here. So right now I am back at Western. I had taken up a couple years off and I am returning to do a post back before applying for my master's in ceramics eventually. Um, so these pieces are closer to size of like four to five feet, the two large ones. And on the left, I'm using a stoneware, and on the right, I'm using the terracotta. Um, this next body of work is kind of to speak on me and my identity as being half Native American Mexican and half um, German and Polish. So I'm trying to in integrate those two. Um, and that's kind of what I'm working on right now. Um, I'm going to, and this is the piece on the left that's in the show right now. You can kind of see like the ideas of like um, like figurative, like body shape um, and trying to like just show like you can see beauty in all different shapes and sizes. They don't have to be totally symmetrical or perfect. And yeah, let me click into this for you guys. few videos to show. We'll start down here. Sorry, this one's kind of small. Ooh, that's a little loud. But yeah, each piece I do these tiny coils and then I smear each one together and it creates this strong structure from the terracotta vessels. And then we have, this is me. Um, smearing the pieces together. And you can see it's just with the little pinch. Oh, I'm sorry, guys. Hmm, give me one second. I knew there was going to be technical difficulties. <laughs> All right. Let's see. Hmm. Maybe I can, all right, here we go. We're getting closer. Sorry guys. Mm -hmm. Thanks for being patient with me. It's 
still learning about this stuff. Okay, so now you can see the video um, of me like smearing them together. And this is like the start of one of my big pieces. And then we also have, this is really just how I'm making the coils. I start by rolling it through my hands and then about like two feet long, I do a ton of coils. And then I have this one as well. And like I tend, they like grow and grow. And so half the time I'm standing on, standing up or I have to get a stool or moving them onto the ground. And now they're getting so large that I tend to have to get some help moving these heavy pieces around. Yeah, you can see like the process and just the repetition and the tactility of the clay is what like I'm so in love with the material. And I find like, I want to emphasize that beauty of the clay. And then just for like size reference, you can like see how like big these are. <laughs> Sorry, it's a little goofy. I'm a little goofy. Alrighty. <laughs> Thank you guys. Um, and if you want to see more of my work or whatnot, that's my Instagram handle up there on the right. Um, but yeah, do you guys have any more questions for me? Or have any questions for me? Sorry. So what size is your kiln? What size is my kiln? Yeah. So um, at home, I have a kiln, an electric kiln. And it is about 36 inches. Um, it's a round barrel. But at Western, we have kilns that are up to eight feet tall. And so depending on where I'm working kind of makes me decide on how big I can or cannot go. Anyone else have a question? Yeah. Can use the Say what? Can use the no, I've actually, I haven't taken any classes here before, um, possibly in the future, but I'm not sure yet. How big is the kiln here? That's okay if you don't know. <laughs> yeah. Do you find that the, um, do you think you'll stick with the coiling technique as opposed to throwing rods or, or combining throwing? Can you just talk about the different ways you could construct these forms? Yeah. So the question is, will I keep coiling or will I find different ways to construct the pieces bigger? Um, so I guess it's the reason I do the coiling is to accentuate my um, smearing with my finger. And that's mostly done with the coils. But in the future, yes, for a more like stronger structure, um, I could throw part of it to do it quicker and then add a section on top as well. And then I could coil the outsides and smear and add my texture in that way. So yeah, it's possible that later I will find a different way of creating height or size. Thank you. Yeah, anyone else? Awesome, thank you guys so much for coming.